Perfect. Okay. So I'm super happy to introduce Ken Quinn today uh, for the first of her two lectures uh, focused on molecules and ultra cold chemistry. And I understand from Caden that there's been a lack of molecular talks and presentations at the summer school, which is a bit disappointing because the vast majority of the stuff we interact with today, in fact, is molecules. There are very few atoms around us as it would happen. So uh, I guess many of you have heard that Ken Quinn got her PhD at uh, Jiller, uh, CU Boulder. Um, and as a result of that, she was won the 2010 uh, DeMop thesis prize, which is pretty awesome. And then uh, since then has been working as, as faculty at Harvard. And as a result of that research, um, she has won the 2019 APS Robbie prize. Um, I guess nine years after the thesis price. So it's not, I guess a power of three. So it's worth something. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much for joining us. And we look forward to a bunch of awesome uh, physics about molecules. Great, yeah, thank you, um, Ian, for the nice introduction and, and everyone for attending. And of course, the organizer for putting this very nice uh, summer school together. Um, Certainly, I very much hope that we were all being in Boulder. I was very much looking forward to it when I was um, accepting the um, the invitation. And, and as we have also discussed a little bit that in 2004, there was also a Boulder summer school on sort of co-atom uh, topics. Specifically, I think it's called quantum coherence in atomic and condensed matter systems. And this was the summer after my first year in graduate school and in I actually didn't attend. <laughs> uh, sadly, was working mostly in the lab, uh, so I'm not having happy to have the opportunity to now attend and to contribute. Um, so, um, in this Boulder Summer School um, for this year, you heard a lot um, of atoms, um, and now in my lecture, we want to talk about molecules. So, um, in fact, I wanted to mention that many pioneers in atomic physics, you know, long ago, uh, they actually work on molecules uh, first because molecule comes in a, you know, gas form comes in a bottle, you know, easy to get molecules. And they have many quantum degrees of freedom on um, various energy lens, uh, uh, scales that one can work with. So let me, um, let me uh, hopefully get this working. Um, yeah, so for today's talk, I'm going to focus on, uh, molecules in tweezers. Uh, well, that's you know, after some introduction, I'm going to talk about molecules in tweezers. And for tomorrow's lecture, I'll focus on, uh, on studying chemistry using these very cold uh, molecules. So um, yeah, so molecular quantum degrees of freedom um, as, um, as shown here that there are many. Um, so let me just go to the really basic and to talk about um, uh, to talk about um, what we're looking at here. So um, what I'm plotting here is energy versus internuclear separation. Let me see if I can use my uh, okay, yeah, inter okay, let me let me. What's the best color? Um, maybe red. Okay, so yeah, energy versus internuclear separation, and you often see these black curves, which are the molecular potentials. So let me just say uh, a, a few words uh, about that. I want to actually go, go into some derivation before going to the, all the different degrees of freedom we have in molecules. So the simplest uh, molecules is. Uh, H2 plus, okay? So it's a molecule that made out of uh, two atoms, okay? Two protons, um, so plus charges uh, separated by some distance. I'm going to call that R. And there's only one electrons, okay? So we can write the Hamiltonian for such a system uh, as the following, where we take into account you know, the kinetic energy turns of the, uh, the nuclei, the protons, uh, the kinetic energy turn of the, uh, the electrons, and the interaction between all the parties, right? So the interaction between the nuclei, you know, one of them and, and, the, and the electron, and then the other one with the electron. So we had to sum all the interaction and the interaction between uh, two nuclei. Okay. so. Um, Usually, uh, when one deals with molecule, 
you know, these problems are very complicated, but one can um, make some simple assumption. For example, we say, let's just ignore this turn. Uh, the kinetic energy of the nuclear because is very, very heavy. The, the uh, proton is much heavier, 2,000 times heavier than electron. And therefore, uh, that kinetic energy is going to be uh, very small um, in comparison. So we can ignore that. And um, we're interested in, in looking at sort of the electronic potential. Uh, so we're going to first ignore uh, this term, which doesn't depend on the coordinate of the electron. And this actually only depends on the separation of the nuclei. Okay, so something like the cooling interaction of the nuclei. Okay, so now we're left with two terms. Um, and we can solve a Schrodinger equation with just two terms. And this is uh, um, a sort of, sin, you know, a, a simple but very useful uh, approximation. Okay, so now a very, now we had to deal with the potential um, and we can even make it even more simpler uh, to say like, okay, these potentials are like particle in the box. And we have two of them because we have an atom on the left and an atom on the right. And uh, they're separated by some distance r again. Okay, and then we have again just one electron. Okay, so the electron could be on the left, could be on the right, could be somewhere in between. Okay, so um, now we can again now solve for uh, energy versus, you know, what we're going to do first is to uh, say these two particles in the box are really, really far away. So the energy of the you know, electron being on the left or being on the right are basically degenerate, right? It's just the energy of an electron in a particle in the box. So that would be a very large R. So it will be over here that say, you know, they're degenerate. I'm, they should be degenerate. I'm drawing them with a little bit of separation for clarity. Okay. And and now, and then that's the ground state energy. Of course, they have also excited state energy. And I'm not go, I'm going to deal with that uh, for the moment. And now if we start calculating for every R, you know, start like bringing the R closer and closer, then we will eventually see um, a curve like this, basically, right? So they start with degeneracy, but then as they get closer and closer, they're going to start to interact. And basically we can, just think of it as a two level system with energy started out with like zero, for example, and then they have some coupling due to this probability of tunneling and, and then interacting uh, in, in the region, um, you know, in some, in some sense, the forbidden region of, of outside this box. Okay, so, um, in, so, so in the chemistry notation, uh, you know, it looks actually very similar. For example, if we have, you know, two hydrogen and then they will say, you know, once we bring the two hydrogen coals together, the energies of these degenerate level is going to shift. One goes up and one goes down. And um, the one that goes down is called the bonding, bonding orbitals or bonding, yeah, orbitals. And, and, and then the one goes up is anti-bonding orbitals. Okay, so now this is ignoring this turn, um, the nuclear repulsion, okay? So it'll just diverge, okay? So if you solve for this problem, it'll just uh, eventually, uh, you know, the, the energy diverges. But now if we add, may, oops, what happened to it? <laughs> um, it's all gone, okay. <laughs> does that help? No, does it? Okay, so sorry about that. Um, not sure why it just went away. Okay, so let me just um, just draw um, just the simple part. Okay. Now, um, energy again versus the separation of these two uh, boxes, and it goes divergent. Okay. So now um, I'm going to write the Hamiltonian um, on the right here. And this we ignore. Okay, but so far we have also ignored this term, which is the uh, coolant repulsion of the nuclei. So now, if we add this term, then, as you know, that um, the energy of the repulsion is positive, and that means, and also when the distance of the two uh, proton is very very close, it's a very very you know, it's very repulsive, right? So if you add that, then this is what you'll get. Um, 
from from this divergent, you know, from 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 this starting with some degeneracy when they're really far away. Um, to separating together, uh, to uh, to adding the and then now you like a potential. Okay, so of course we can do better. You know, we the particle doesn't need to. You know, the the, the potential that we we uh, approximate using this box potential, and um, in you know a better guess will be you know for example as I was using the the um, the chemistry notation um, instead of using these box potential and and using that solution as our starting point we can use like say something like the one s orbital of hydrogen okay so we can actually use these um, hydrogen orbitals or hydrogen like orbitals to describe to as as our initial point to uh, to start building up um, the more complicated system Okay, so now um, looking at this, um, you we now have an electronic potential. Uh, of the molecule the energy versus the separation of the nuclei. And I'm only drawing, you know, the, the starting with the ground state uh, solution, and then we end up with two, you know, we start with two, two solution, go to two more solution once they interact. And of course, there is higher lying uh, potential uh, on top of that. That would, you know, for example, we start if we have also, you know, work with um, 2s, for example, or 2p, then, you know, we, we will end up with even more uh, potential. Uh, that they are just higher uh, in energy. Okay. Um, okay. So now with this potential, uh, these electrons actually serve as a glue for the nuclei. Okay. So basically, what we've solved so far is is including these three terms. Okay. And now if we say, okay, those are just potential for the nuclei. Okay. So if I want, uh, sorry, this to solve for what the Schrodinger equation will be for the nuclei, I'll call that um, potential just V, then, um, then what we will then solve is using this potential that's, that, we're, that, that we can see here and, and start solving that. And these are going to be uh, the potential that bounds the nuclei. Okay, so this will be the vibration of the, of, the vibration of, of the of the molecules of, of the atoms actually the the nuclei. Okay, so now um, if we look finer than each of these nuclei, you know, we ha we can add additional turn like these these molecule can start to rotate and then um, and then let me just um, hopefully this oh man this is gone again. Okay, so now um, now going back to this picture. Um, Let's see if I can have a, yeah, have a laser beam. Okay, you can see my laser beam. Okay, so now um, now we have these vibrational level uh, that are uh, built from these electronic potentials. And if we look in more uh, carefully in each vibrational level, then we also see that molecules can rotate and then have these levels uh, with, with some very interesting spacing. Okay. And then if we look even finer in energy scale, uh, you know, as symbolized by this box over here, then we see the spins, uh, the, the hyperfine levels of the um, of the molecules. And that that arise, of course, from um, the nuclear spins of the of the atoms and then and they can also interact with the electrons. Okay, so um, so that's what I wanted to, to give you an impression of, you know, very simple picture of where all these comes from, just from simple picture of the atom, building up from the atom. Now, okay, it's there, okay. So now, um, you know, my talk is going to be a little bit with chemistry and physics. I want to tie these things together. So I wanted to say something about how these molecular degrees of freedom um, is beneficial in the chemistry community. Okay, so, you know, these are really sort of fingerprints of the molecules. So they allow, um, they allow molecules to be identified in their innate um, environments. And, and these 
So the quantum degrees of freedom, for example, the vibration degrees of freedom, let me just use this, vibration degrees of freedom can be used for imaging, okay? So basically what you're seeing here, uh, this is called Rama imaging. It's on the left-hand side, we have a microscope, um, you know, light field microscope pictures of a slice of, this, this is a sample of a brain, okay? And then if we know something about the molecular content, then you know, using Rama imaging, uh, stimulated Rama imaging, then it actually shows something in the right uh, that's shown on the right, and you can see that it's actually look quite different. You know, you can you can make out that they are the same field of view, but it's quite different uh, between the one on the left and one one on the right because uh, the content is different. Okay, so the tumor has more protein, and the normal sort of brain you know, imaging has more lipid and that different molecules show up at different frequency, characteristic frequency, and that could be utilized imaging, uh, imaging, you know, biological samples. Okay. So other things, for example, um, using the, uh, the spin degrees of freedom, uh, looking for water, but it's actually just looking for hydrogen because for oxygen, it turns out the nucleus spin uh, for oxygen 16 is, 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 is zero. So it's really just looking for a protein um, and, and you can, uh, sorry, pro, looking for proton. And as you can see that um, you know, using nuclear magnetic imaging, you can know where water is in this cup of corn. Conquin? Yes. Uh, so on the left plot of your yeah. uh, tumor and lipids and everything's there, uh, I guess the light can't penetrate very deep, deep into a sample. So yeah. is this just near a surface or a thin slice of something? Or? Yeah, these are thin slices. So, so that is certainly uh, a limitation of these techniques. Um, you know, things that, that are very deep that cannot be seen. Yeah, but this, these are just, yeah, these are samples of, you know, mouse brain slice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and also I wanted to say to uh, feel free to ask any questions on if you. If they, and just as a heads up, uh, Ian and I will keep our eyes on the chat. So if somebody okay, asks a yeah, question, then yeah. we'll read it out for you. Um, yeah. let, let, on your first, you know, slide, you also were sort of uh, throwing away the off-diagonal terms of the nuclear kinetic energy. So I guess Born-Oppenheimer type approximation. Um, right. Probably that's pretty excellent approximation. But do we ever have to worry about this and the things we think about? Or? Uh, the non the the non adiabatic turns or uh, yeah so so yeah we do actually um but but I guess theorists usually deal with that <laughs> and I'm an experimentalist so that gives that gives that gives rise to um what does it give rise to it gives rise to potential energy crossings um and they happens all the time and also in molecules yeah. But you know, if you just want to think very uh, simply, uh, the, these are the, the sort of the that gave you sort of eighty percent of the way through, basically. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, now uh, these are, uh, as I had mentioned previously, uh, that the pioneers in atomic physics actually. Uh, have worked with molecules, um, and and you know, sort of the transition I wanted to make is that in in the chemistry of biological sampling or instrumentation domain, you know, these molecular degrees of freedom are useful uh, to identify those species in their innate environments, and they they actually are very useful for many things like detecting of you know gases, you know, polluted gases and these kind of things in in like row size service, you know, these kind of things. Like these are all a lot of those are based on measuring vibration or measuring, you know, infrared uh, um, uh, transitions of of molecule like uh, toxic gases and these kind of things. But um, in the physics domain, uh, people are using these um, this transition, these fingerprints of molecule more, you know, wanted to use and serve as standard, at, at least, you know, since, you know, the first atomic clock, which was actually based on the ammonia molecules. So, Conklin, uh, there's a question in the chat yeah. from Garrett. It asks, uh, in imaging applications, are you ever worried about the wavelength of your probing beam changing as it penetrates the tissue? Well, so... <laughs> 
Actually, that's that's a good question. So in the particular example I was showing, uh, these are Raman imaging. So it actually has two. Uh, so basically, it's usually a transition. Um, usually, it's a two photon process. You know, something like like this, and then you know maybe detune from somewhere else, some virtual state, and. And, and, and then hitting you know, a vibration tra changing transition. So in that case, if it were to really change a little bit, you know, it's, it's, it's already off resonance you know, in terms of a single photon. So, so, so that I don't think is um, a big issue, but I don't really work on that. So I'm not totally sure. <laughs> it's, it's what I would think. Okay. Okay, so um, now um, the first atomic clock was actually based on the vibration of ammonia molecule, which um, it, which is the particular mode of turning um, this ammonia molecule inside out at a frequency of twenty four gigahertz, and this and also um, um, the the first maser was actually based on ammonia molecule as well, um, as, as you can see, that molecule played an important role in the uh, pioneering experiment in, um, in atomic physics. And I've shown this this picture to uh, you know, given talks showing this picture. And one time, uh, Dan Klapner was in the audience, and later he was coming to talk to me about this clock, and. Uh, um, and of course, you guys know that Dan Kleppner uh, and, and, and Norman Ramsey, they work on uh, hydrogen maser. So they're a bit of a rivalry, right? A bit of a rivalry between this. And although, you know, atomic, you know, the first atomic clock was um, based on ammonia molecule, it was the first time that, you know, any timekeeping is based on vibration of, of atoms or, or molecule and not celestial motion. But from Dan's um, point of view, it's actually widely inaccurate because uh, molecules is very sensitive to a lot of things, you know, sensitive to electric field, sensitive to the environment. It's not as good, you know, certainly not as good as hydrogen atom and what you can do in terms of controlling hydrogen and atom. And of course, we know that Maser is still being used um, today, and and we don't really use uh, really ammonia masers or or a clock based on ammonia molecules. So so he was right, um, and 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 a lot of the development of you know motivation of building better atomic clock, uh, you know a lot of the technical development or you know conceptual and technical development to to enable better clock building has really revolutionized. Um, our field of atomic uh, molecular physics. Okay, so um, so let me um, now, you know, because you just use this as an analogy. Okay, so so we want to have a frequency uh, that we can ultimately. Uh, this talk is not about clock, but you know, this the same idea apply to many two level systems. Um, we want to be able to, you know, to use the frequency of an atom um, as serve as a standard, you know, so exactly, you know, for, for clock, for example, and exactly what is ticking, you know, so I want to give you a visual picture. Um, so, so, uh, so the ticking of a clock is really a superposition of an electron uh, in say two different levels or, or multiple different levels, right? So for example, if you take an S orbitals and then P orbitals and put them in superposition, what you will get is, is, is this. I mean, of course I'm playing this uh, 10 to the 15 times slower than what it really um, is in, in an optical clock, but this is the ticking of the clock. And, and you can really think of any two level system when you drive it in superposition, there's something that's moving, right? It's something that's moving. So I think this is a very nice uh, picture uh, to, to think about, you know, two level system to think about connecting these um, ideas, you know, visual kind of visually to all the different systems that we're working with. And, Okay, so now, um, of course, I have alluded to that uh, atomic clock, you know, you know, the invention of say laser cooling and all these techniques have enabled, uh, you know, ever increasing um, uh, 
ever increasing accuracy and, and, and precision that we now can have with atomic clock. And uh, just to kind of close the loop, I think uh, nowadays we wouldn't lose, you know, these clock are so good that we wouldn't lose uh, one second uh, uh, during the, the whole age, age, age of the universe. Okay, while, while the first atomic clock, I think the number there was uh, once, I think it was written there, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was written there specifically. Yeah, so accurate that it will lose one second in uh, 300 years. And so you can see that we've come a long way. Okay, so um, let me, uh, oops, uh, I wanted to go back here. Now, um, of course, now we all, you know, many of the in, in the summer school talk about that the atom has been 10, you know, now we can use atom to do a lot of things. And um, the sense of the technique are now being applied to molecules. And we can also beginning to do a lot of things with molecules. So we're going from sort of molecule because it's easy to work with, you know, they come in a bottle and, you know, and they have all these frequencies that one can work with, you know, in the pioneering days. And then to add them because you can, you can, you can better control it. Um, it's simple, or better control for a lot of the application. And now we can, again, go back to molecule. It's a more complicated system and control more sort of degrees of freedom. Okay, so this includes that we need to do cooling, trapping uh, of, you know, molecules that will again allow us to have um, the again to allow us to probe them for a long time and to allow the molecule to interact um, to uh, to uh, enable uh, you know, measurement of many different things um, um, and 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 perhaps even sort of building up a more complex quantum system from these already kind of more complex uh, but coherent quantum system, you know, more complex compared to atoms, but but still well controlled. Um, okay, so people in this field of ultra cold molecule pursue all sort of all uh, techniques of control of molecule for a variety of different motivations, um, which um, I'm listed down uh, down here. And let me just go into a little bit more detail on some of them, or still overview on some of them, and then a little bit more detail. Uh, um, so overview on the search for new physics and the ultra cold chemistry, and then a little bit more detail about sort of quantum engineering based on uh, molecules. Okay, so um, so the draw of you know I would say like a very important uh, example. In We'll make sure she repeats whatever she's saying uh, into the void right now. Welcome back. You froze on us, Kong Gwen. So. Yeah, sorry. I just, it completely, uh, I don't know, it just shut off. The Zoom just shut off on me. So I'm now switching to the wire network and then I'm going to try to um, see if I can do. Sure, sounds good. I yeah, think we lost ahead. you right about when you switched to the uh, slide and we're saying, you know, here are the things you can do with the molecules. Yeah, okay, so let me just, I'm, I'm gonna take out one cable here. Sorry.
Okay. Um, is so this lie is. Yeah, we and we saw you pull that slide up, but then that's okay. right when you froze. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 So let me um, rearrange things a little bit. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, yeah. So um, so the most notable example I would say is the uh, the search for electron electric dipole moment with molecules, and that actually. Um, there is many efforts and, and, and have been going on for the last, I would say, 20 years um, or, or maybe even longer. And, uh, and already they have really good result where um, they have pushed these um, sort of null result, um, stringent tests of the, uh, the electron electric dipole moment, the null result uh, by two orders of magnitude compared to uh, what was achieved previously with atom. And the reason uh, that molecules are, you know, specific kind of molecules are very suitable is because for these kind of measurements, uh, one will want to have, um, um, you know, very high sensitivity to what one is trying to measure, you know, the electron, these bond distortion of atomic orbitals enhance the sensitivity, you know, the molecule is not spherical, it has, you know, the preferred axis, these uh, enhance uh, these these um, these um, sensitivity uh, to to the to the to the electric dipole moment, and moreover, um, in molecule you can find basically for these kind of experiment you basically list down what you want. You know you want ways where you can cancel systematic. You want the you know magnetic dipole moment of the molecule to be close to zero and, um, so that it's not going to disguise as an electric dipole moment signal, uh, these sort of thing. Basically, you can list down what you want and then go into um, the periodic table and pick out, you know, two, two atoms to make up the molecules that you want to fulfill that requirement. So that's, I would say, is the powerfulness of molecule system is, is that it's so diverse and it has so many knobs that if you come with a list, you're probably going to be able to find the molecule, the ideal molecule for that particular test. And that certainly seems to be the case for the electron electric dipole moment. That was basically what was laid out. Like we want this property, high sensitivity, you know, large effect electric field. We want the magnetic, I, I, I worked on an experiment um, like that in Jilla for two years. So I was, you know, part of that pursuit um, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Okay. But, but of course the challenge, like once you pick out the, the right molecule you want, the challenge lies at how you perform the quantum control. So that's, um, so, so, um, so, um, that that's that's an area to continue to sort of develop. Okay, so so the more recent or the sort of future generation of these kind of experiments are beginning to bring some of those techniques. You know, looking at bringing those techniques such as laser cooling or molecule, laser coolable molecule, uh, to be and then while having very high sensitivity to all the things you want uh, in in one package. I won't say too much about these other example, but other than to say, you can imagine, you know, inside molecule, two nuclei are very close, so it's hard to get closer than that. Uh, um, well, you know, for 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 atom and molecule, for for like manageable test mess, I would say. Uh, so one can use that as a test mess to to explore uh, uh, gravity and nanometer scales, and. Uh, um, as I alluded to a little bit about, you know, we're starting with uh, talking about building molecules from atom. Um, certainly simple molecules, uh, these Schrodinger equations are easier to solve and, and but it's more complicated than atom and therefore um, they serve as a purpose of testing, you know, the next level of precision of the theory. If we can calculate it really well and then compare it to a very precise experiment. Okay, so this is sort of in the area of fundamental physics with molecule. Now, one could also explore fundamental chemistry with, with co-molecules. Um, and uh, um, here I just listed some example, um, and I won't go into too much details. Um, and, and the example would be, uh, 
you know, what, what I have uh, described at the beginning when I built a molecule, I chose the simplest molecule, you know, only one electron. But in, in reality, all the molecules have more than one electron, you know, uh, even H2, you know, H2 now have two electrons and that become uh, not exactly solvable. But quantum chemistry, uh, you know, quantum chemistry calculation usually refers to calculating the electronic structure of molecule and atom. They have ways, you know, building up hard tree fog uh, um, orbitals and calculating uh, e energy for these, these, these systems and then do variation and on top of that to, to become more and more accurate. Okay, so there is a current say gold standard quantum chemistry calculation, you know, starting with the simplest mean field calculation and then build up on some, um, you know, inco in, in, incorporate some correlation. Uh, and, and, in, and then one can imagine um, calculating for simple systems such as, you know, NO plus helium. Okay, so basically the way these calculation goes is you fix the, the position of you fix the position of the nuclei and then you, you know, write down the whole Schrodinger equation and then calculate the potential. And then you, you change the geometry of all the nuclei again and then either, you know, and, and then you build up the whole potential energy surface. Kind of like what we did uh, at the very beginning. And then, um, and then from there you can calculate, um, you know, in, in this particular um, example, sorry, can't really, don't know how to get rid of this bar here. Um, Does clicking done work? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, okay. But but then when I have the uh, the laser pointer, it just comes comes out again. Okay. So in these particular papers, um, they uh, they look at collision cross sections, which. You know, collision is a very sensitive probe of uh, underlying potentials, and then compare that to um, what they say. You know, gold standard, which has these abbreviations CCSDT, and 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 they really need to incorporate more correlation CCSDTQ. <laughs> uh, don't worry about all these uh, abbreviations. And so that's that's a way of saying like these co-molecule collision experiment can now probe. Uh, chemistry, quantum chemistry calculation beyond what's considered gold standard. So another example would be, you know, uh, synthesizing some exotic uh, species, uh, or uh, as I'll talk more about uh, tomorrow, to really see uh, a chemical reactions uh, transforming uh, molecular species from one species to another and in between there's these intermediate actually live uh, a, a, a very very uh, dramatically long time um, and, and, and direct detection of that uh, was enabled also for the fact that uh, everything is prepared at a very cold temperature. Okay so uh, now what I wanted to talk about uh, next uh, for the rest of today's lecture is to, to give it some idea and some idea that we and Caden and many other people have been thinking about is, you know, molecule is of course a very complex system, but how, how do we actually take advantage of all these different quantum degrees of freedoms to tailor to a particular quantum engineering application that we, we want? Okay, so in sort of the direction of gates. And then I want to uh, introduce the experimental techniques that we're going toward that in particular, we want to prepare and we have been preparing single molecules or individual molecule and, and the particular technique we use, uh, there are many as, as shown here and one could do laser cooling on molecule and then directly grab single uh, molecule out of it or assembling molecules from atoms, uh, from individual atoms or um, one could also work with molecular ions. Okay, so this is what I will be focused uh, on. Okay, so, and then tomorrow I'll talk about uh, probing uh, some micro Kelvin chemistry. Okay, so let me um, reiterate uh, that, uh, you know, we going through all the trouble to control molecules, uh, you know, certainly is much harder because of the add-on degrees of freedom 
sorry, I'm looking for my mouse here. Um, yeah, and the, the, the add-on degrees of freedom um, is to hopefully allow us to take advantage of the, the you know, these large variety of internal state for different purpose in one, um, you know, in, in one package. So, for example, um, if you want to have a very high uh, fidelity entanglement between two particles, um, or, or, or um, yeah, just, you know, quantum gate, uh, quantum bits, you want, you want there are degrees of freedom where we can store that information uh, without environmental perturbation, but at the same time, we want them to entangle, so there will be interaction involved, and that seems to be contradicting one another, right? Like if you want interact, if you want you know no perturbation, then you don't want interaction, <laughs> and if you want interaction, you know then then it's it's going to perturb your system. So you kind of want these two things in the same quantum system. How do you achieve that? Uh, there are many different ways, but in molecule we hope to use the different internal degrees of freedom to achieve that. And, and then because they're intrinsically coherent um, and that will allow us to um, hopefully allow us to get very high fidelity uh, qubit. And, and this, uh, for example, um, these degrees of freedom, what I'm talking about is, you know, spin degrees of freedom for, for information storage and rotation, um, you know, basically these S and P drawing the different, you know, uh, manifestation S and P, um, you know, the de rotation degrees of freedom, the S and P uh, orbitals to allow dipole-dipole interaction. And I, I, and I think um, in Antoine uh, Broadway's talk, he had introduced uh, a lot about um, you know, opposite parity states and and dipole dipole interaction so this actually used you know all the same thing basically but now the difference is that these opposite parity states in molecules for us we're thinking about uh, rotation states okay so these rotation states are intrinsically coherent they can live you know in, you know they they don't you know, they, if we have an excitation in rotation states, they can live there for seconds. Uh, they can live then for a very long time. Um, and that's where we think the advantage of a, of a molecule uh, comes. Okay. So, but, but one, um, one has these different degrees of freedom. One needs another ingredient, which is that we need to be able to pull that uh, excitation from one degrees of freedom to another right um you know we we want the interaction to happen um in let's say in when the molecules are in this particular state you know, opposite parity say one is here one is there or one is here one is there and they can exchange that dipole dipole interaction but normally uh we don't want them to interact so we want the excitation to look down here so there will have to be some transfer of information uh, transfer of uh, excitation going from this manifold, you know, zero and one to the zero and E manifold, for example. Okay, so these molecules are actually often had intrinsic molecular coupling. So we don't need to mediate it with a laser beam, which can have classical noise. Uh, we don't have to mediate it with an electric field. They are intrinsically there, you know, <laughs> molecules are, these, these, or, these orbits are slightly non-symmetric and then they're going to interact with the nuclei slightly differently. And then they're naturally going to split these levels. Okay, so then one can utilize in these intrinsic molecular coupling to be able to bring this um, excitation from one, you know, in some sense, one degrees of freedom to another degrees of freedom. Okay, so, um, let me just uh, put this all out here. Um, so specifically, you know, if we want to say entangle the two molecule, we need to realize a Bell state. And uh, again, uh, the zero and the E shown here is like the G and the E that's shown in, 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 in Twan's. Uh, so we're looking, let's say if we want to build a Bell state just for these, uh, for these two molecules um, that are living in the zero and E, um, you know, manifold. Uh, so you can think of it as the G and the E in Antoine's uh, uh, talk. Um, then 
then what you will do is the following this recipe. Basically, we will prepare a superposition um, in zero and E. So think about the super the ticking of the clock, and you know, we put it in the superposition of zero and E. So it's you know it's um, oscillating, um, but as a single particle, um, and then they interact via these dipole dipole interaction with matrix elements, something like you know, H bar omega. Um, we can characterize them for molecules. That's typically on the order of say kilohertz with a micron separation. So much slower compared to uh, Reaper um, atoms in general, but the coherent, the absolute coherent time scale is is, is longer. So one has to compare a uh, different sort of uh, uh, figure of mirror or a ratio of them. And then, so we wait for the appropriate amount of time and then apply another global sort of pi over two pulse, you know, the same that you prepare the 50-50 uh, superposition, then you realize the bell state. Okay, so that's sort of the general idea. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip this. Um, but of course, there are complete, you know, there are some realistic com complication that comes with using molecule is that instead of these three levels, zero, one, and E that I was talking to you about, like they're all feel insensitive. I didn't quite mention that, but they can all be feel insensitive, fulfill a lot of requirement that we want. The reality is that um, in the ground state, instead of the zero and one, there's really say for, in the case of sodium and cesium, uh, it's really 32 states. And in the first excited, you know, the P, the rotation excited state, it's really like a hundred states, right? So those other states are also nearby. We can figure out how to utilize them efficiently, uh, turning, you know, one molecule into five qubits because they're, you know, five pairs of two level system or, or they could become a, 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 a limitation, right? So, so the choice of our molecule, I just, this calculation is also done for sodium, uh, is for a molecule made out of two alkali atoms, sodium and cesium. Um, just to put in some numbers, um, we found that, you know, with this um, sort of aiming for a very fast time scale and physically, uh, uh, realizable, you know, putting the sort of micron or even a little bit sub micron apart, uh, we can have very fast exchange time scale, um, 50 microseconds. But the fidelity would be limited simply because there are other states that are so close that you can go into the, you exchange the wrong uh, hyperfine states. Yes. Sorry, there's a question here from Garrett. Asking, yeah. it says the preparation sequence reminds me of Ramsey spectroscopy. Does that mean Ramsey spectroscopy produces a Bell state, or am I confusing two different concepts here? Um, yeah. So what we have here, I think the difference, the difference, um, the difference is this. The difference is is this way. Uh, some time and during this time the dipole dipole interactions comes in where they are two particle interaction uh, with this unitary evolution and this is where we allow the entanglement okay so um i think the ramsey um yeah i mean it's very similar but but there's not this interaction turn or at least this very well defined interaction turn does that um answer the question Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. Okay, so now, um, right, so so that this is certainly, uh, I would say, a disadvantage of a molecule. At least this is a molecule that we chose for for other nice reasons. Uh, but 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 one could imagine we can also choose molecule where these sort of feel insensitive. You know, now here is nuclear spin state. These feel insensitive states are much farther apart than they are, um, you know, Zeeman level, there are Zeeman levels. Um, so a molecule involving with a spin and where their energy levels are more, more space, but their uh, field sensitivity could still be low. Okay. But one could also say, you know, because we have so much coherence, we expect it to have so much coherence, we can simply just wait longer, you know, make things slower, not having the two molecule as close, 
have them a little bit farther apart. Um, and then if we were to calculate that, then you know, allowing much faster, uh, sorry, slower time scale, you know, three milliseconds of exchange time, then we can bring that uh, number up by you know, uh, increasing that the uh, in, increasing the fidelity. Okay, so here is a calculation that shows that basically we can, if we wait longer and longer and longer, we can just keep going uh, to be better. But of course, experimentally, we had to realize many other things that need to uh, simultaneously be good. Uh, and we have actually evaluated what we think are the possible sources of errors. And in this paper, anyone who's interested can, can look at that. Um, and, and we believe that is, um, you know, we certainly set a goal, you know, a very high goal uh, that we're working toward. Okay, but the first step is even to uh, to show that we can entangle molecules, of course. Okay, so um, now now I wanted to bring to the experimental side. Um, I'm right, looking for my mouse again. Um, okay, so now um, what I this picture that I was describing, you know, we want a molecule here and there, exactly the distance we want in a particular state, and we had this sequence to put them into Bell state, right? So we have a we need to have a lot of controls. Um, so what we, you know, experimentally, let's say like the most flexible geometry would be if we have the individual molecule control. These molecules are prepared in a single quantum state. And uh, you know, to start, we want to prepare them in the row vibrational ground state, and then we can prepare them in the rotation excited state. Um, and and we also want to prepare these molecule in you know what, when we trap them in the emotional ground state because the interactions are depending on the the separation sensitively, you know, one over r cube. So if they are not, you know, if they are not in a single emotional state, then that also contribute to the the uncertainty of the separation and that give rise to some um, give rise to some infidelity. And, and we have estimated that I think we can deal with something like um, emotional quanta up to 10. But but still it's still it's still mean it still it still means that we need a very good control over the emotional degrees of freedom to have very high uh, fidelity, ultimately very high fidelity entanglement. Okay, so um, so I would say what's working in the com you know working toward this goal. Of course, there's many other experiment that working with molecules in optical lattices. Then they're far along and they have different sort of advantages, meaning that they have have a lot of molecules um, all at once um, and and still close to individual control. Um, but but not exactly individually control. Okay, so so the approach that we um, that are working in the community that I'm I'm involved in both is to grab single molecules from an ensemble of laser cool molecules. Sorry, this 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 box is in the wrong place. It shouldn't be an escape. You know, I was moving things around and and then um, so laser cool uh, directly grab single molecule from a laser cool ensemble. So here's an image of uh, individual molecules. Um, this experiment done in the uh, John Doyle's lab at Harvard. Uh, or we can uh, assemble these molecules from atoms, uh, starting with individual atoms, sodium and cesium, and then make you know single molecule out of it. Okay, so, so, okay, so I'll focus on this, but before I go into that, I want to compare the two approaches because I, I know a lot of people are often ask me like, why two approaches? Well, there's always, it's always good to have multiple approaches because you never know, you know, where one approach gets stuck and, and you know, and, th and there's also uh, a, a wide variety of different uh, things that you could do that apply to the one kind of molecule, but not the other kind of molecule, right? So people don't really ask, why you have, you know, rubidium, and so why you you work with cesium, you know. But people do ask why you work with this molecule and that molecule. I think it's partially because the molecule technology are not um, as advanced yet, and therefore people are not yet, you know, thinking of all the different things that you could do with the different molecules. But 
Okay, so we want to work with different molecules and different approaches. So here I want to compare the two approaches. So with a laser cool, you know, the, the loading of a single molecule from an ensemble has the advantages once that's successful, um, and it has been successful in the case of calcium fluoride, that you get the single molecule directly and you can image them because these are laser coolable molecule, they can be cycled on um, uh, optical transition. But if you want very high, for ultimately very high fidelity um, so quantum science application, you know, for those quantum science applications, there's things that you have to do uh, beyond that. First, you had to purify the internal state. So they could be lying in many, many levels. You had to do optical pumping, okay? And that also has been done in calcium fluoride uh, and, and other, uh, other molecular, laser coolable molecular system. But then um, there, are, but in terms of the emotional control, they're still hot. Okay, so they're, they could be as cold as 10 micro uh, Kelvin. Uh, but if you trap them in a tweezer, they're still sort of 50, 100 um, vibrational, you know, emotional letter. Okay, so they're, they're not in the emotional ground state. So, so one has to do the next step if one wants very high fidelity um, um, for, for very high fidelity application. But if one just wants to play around with these and already, you know, just gaining the single molecule, one could already do a lot of really interesting experiment, you know, single particle uh, physics type of experiment or collision experiment, um, putting two molecules in the same tweezer and see they collide and that sort of thing. Okay. So, uh, Another approach, which is what I'll talk more about, um, is to use single atoms as a starting point. And there's a lot of tools that's already uh, developed for control of atoms. And you've heard uh, many of these talks um, already. And by design, of course, it's difficult to make molecules out of two atoms. And I'll explain why. Uh, but once you make the molecules, they're in the right state, basically. Well, once you make the molecule in the right state, they, they're, it's done, okay. So, so making a molecule from atom is very difficult, but once that's done, then you get all the control that you want. Okay, so, so this is the approach that I'll uh, explain. Okay, so this took a very long time, I would say, um, certainly much longer than I first anticipated. Uh, and, and yes. There's a question from Garrett yes. says, is it guaranteed that the motional ground state of the atoms will be the motional ground state of the molecule? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, in the approximation, so I'll, I'll actually get into that uh, in more detail. So in the approximation, if the two atoms have the same trap frequency and therefore the problem, the potential, you know, turning a two body problem into a one body problem, this is a separable, this potential is separable then yes, I would say. Okay, so I, I, I'll, I'll, I have some formulas that I can show. Um, okay, so let's just uh, first explain, and many of you may be very familiar with this as well, but um, just, I guess this is summer school, so you know, it's a good time to kind of go back to the basic. Um, to explain why it's so difficult to make molecules uh, from atoms, okay, in a very controlled way. So, so the best, let's say, if we wanna make molecule, we want the two atoms to be really close, right? So how close can we bring the two atoms? Um, well, if we trapping them in the optical tweezer, you know, that's, let's say the best we can confine them. These optical tweezer are on the order of a micron, okay? And now if we cool it all the way to the ground state of that tweezer, now the position uncertainty is just a zero point motion um, of that atom trap in the tweezer. Okay, so then that means um, the zero point motion, zero point motion, let me write it down here. Is using this formula uh, square root of uh, h bar over two m omega. Okay, so if I plug in, say, cesium um, to this, you know, with a mass of cesium and the trap frequency of, say, 20 kilohertz, which is the weak, weakest direction of 
our travel usually, the, the propagation direction of the tweezer. Then that number, uh, that zero point motion, you know, wavelength or, you know, characteristic size is 50 nanometer, okay? And then I can put another um, atoms in the same trap and each has a spread of 50 nanometer. And you can imagine the probability of finding two atoms at the distance of what we want for a molecule, let's say 0.2 nanometer is, uh, is actually, you know, this is very small, right? The probability, this wave function overlap is extremely small. Okay, so that's challenge number one. Challenge number two is that, um, when the two molecule comes together, you know, they are, you know, they started out with that, that we call them zero energy. They had to drop, they had to release the binding energy, which on the temperature scale could be like thousands of Kelvin to go all the way down to the row vibration, to the vibrational ground state. Okay. So that energy has to go somewhere uh, and not to be deposited into the gas or the particle or in the particle of relevance. Um, so that needs to be removed, right? Okay, so, um, so, okay. So there actually being solution to that for the, for the last more than 10 years. Um, and that was done in um, Jula, Innsbruck and, and follow up by many uh, groups around the world. And the solution is the following. Okay, so first, there are two steps. First, one can bind an atom into a weakly bound molecule. Maybe I'll use this uh, laser pointer. Okay, weakly bound molecule through a final Feshbach resonance. Okay, so uh, Feshbach, and then we usually call that Feshbach molecule. So say in the context of bulk gas, you could do that. In the context of individual atoms, you could do that. Um, basically that in the context of bulk gas, you prepare them in a single quantum state. Okay, in the case of atom, in the case of um, you know single atom in the in 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 the in in the tweezer, then we can already prepare them in a single quantum state. But now in the molecular state, in the state where they are bound. But on this kind of potential energy picture, you know, here and here is the ground state. There are two different ground state. One shallow, or one is this. Basically, one is this bonding orbital, the other one is a little bit the anti-bonding, but it's still bound due to, you know, interaction with other potential. Uh, it's very shallow, shallowly bound. And actually, in fact, it's not even in the ground state of these shallow potential. It's basically still at uh, energy zero. Okay. But, but they're much closer now. Okay. So that's the step number one. Step number two is that one still need to release um, a large amount of energy to all, go all the way down to the vibrational ground state. So the second step is to take that energy away using stimulated photon. So we can have two laser beams that connect to some states or virtually connected to some states or detuned from a particular state such that if a molecule go from here to here, you know, absorb photon, emit photon in a coherent way, that binding energy is dissipated into the photon in the field. And then we end up with a molecule in say the raw vibrational ground state uh, with very, uh, with, with no add-on um, energy. Okay, so I wanted to say for exactly two atoms that we've done now, um, we can this make this molecule with 30% efficiency. So this certainly is much larger than this 10 to the minus six number that I was you know, showing you, you know, if you just do it by chance, right? Um, okay, so, and then that's really because we can prepare, we take the advantage of quantum control, we prepare then in single quantum state, and then the second step is really uh, a process to map from one quantum state to another quantum state. Okay, so um, so first we had to prepare the atoms. So that means we had to first, okay, capture a single atom. So you've probably seen these photos uh, before from so Antoine's talk, uh, single atoms. We can take, get a single cesium atom, single sodium atom. We want to use these different species of atoms because ultimately in the vibrational ground state, it has a large dipole moment. It has a 
preference of you know pulling electron to one side or the other, and that will ultimately give rise to the dipole-dipole interaction between the molecules. We usually take you know the sequence where we you know first load the atoms. We have you know is a stochastic process as Antoine has explained. Uh, so we have say thirty three percent of the chances that we load a single sodium and a single cesium side by side. These are actually the same field of view. We just take them uh, sequentially so that better sort of uh, signal to noise. Sometimes we only get one atoms, you know one cesium or just sodium, or sometimes we don't get any atoms. Okay, so we can take this image. And then we can do our experiment. We know what we loaded. And then we can take another image at the end of the experiment and see what's left. And then we can post select based on these results. We can also rearrange our, you know, we're beginning to gain, um, gain uh, capability, rearrange our, our, you know, our, our atoms such that we always, you know, we are very, you know, this number, you know, basically rearrange in such a way such that we throw away um, the chances where we're not loading anything. Okay, but that's that's just um, a technical aspect. So we can load single atom. So actually, all of these data are useful because sometimes we want to look for something that involves both atoms, and sometimes we want to have a control experiment that involves just one atom. So then we know what is the effect that's coming from the two atoms, and what is the experiment that that only comes from you know that only care about one atoms. So we load we. Uh, Prepare them in the and cooling them down to the emotional ground state using Raman Saiban cooling. And I'm not going to go into any detail of that, but just to say we're able to prepare them with some fidelity uh, to the three dimensional ground state. At some point, we're able to do very well, you know, <laughs> for the, and, and now we're still doing very well, but, you know, there's uh, uh, maybe in the 80s or, or something like that. Sorry. It's, uh, Okay, so now, now these atoms are prepared in this picture, you know, separated in their emotional ground state. They're still miles, in some sense, miles apart from being able to form a molecule. So they had to be in the same place. So what we do is to steer these um, tweezers into the same place and drop one of them so that they're both in the same tweezer. Okay, so that whole process takes about a few milliseconds. And we carefully tune this process in such a way, uh, both um, in terms of our sequence, but also in terms of technical limitation. You know, sometimes when you sweep frequency of these, um, of, of the location of, of you know, steering these beams, they can also have amplitude modulation and things like that. So these all had to be taken care of uh, such that these atoms remain in the emotional ground state or as much as we can, as, as best as we can. Okay, so now um, I want to, um, and I kind of already alluded to, I, I wanted to draw this to Eric Cornell's uh, uh, talk, you know, collision of two atoms, and in, in our case, actually exactly two atoms, and it doesn't form a molecule, okay, so he talked about this three-body process that forms a molecule, it really needs a third particle to be around to release this excess energy, because, you know, simultaneously fulfill conservation of energy and momentum for two particles, it's very hard to release that binding energy, okay, so in our case, we use magnetic field or light field to take away that. Okay, so answering sort of the question uh, that that was uh, that was asked previously about these emotional, uh, um, and then actually there are several uh, more slides to to that topic. So when we think about making molecule, you know, we really want to turn a two body problem into a one body problem, right? Um, you know, so the coordinate to use is not, you know, sodium and cesium separately, but rather the center of mass of the two systems and the relative coordinates, okay? So in the case, so I have all, all the things defined here, it's, it looks kind of busy, but in the case where, maybe I'll just write it here, oops. Oh, okay. In the case where the trap frequency that say sodium is equal to cesium or very close to it, then this problem is separable. And you can work, I think, and you probably have already worked out something like this in your quantum class. 
when you have a, especially for a harmonic oscillator, for a harmonic oscillator, uh, this is the case, okay? And in our case, these frequencies are about below 10%. They're, they're similar to about 10%. So for, for just you know, conceptual understanding, we kind of think about them as the same frequency. But of course, in re if, if they're not exactly the same, then, then there are extra terms like this, where you know, they're mixing degrees of freedom, basically. But if, if the frequency are the same, then you can see that as shown here, um, sorry. Oh. As shown here that we can really, using these coordinate definition, you know, really go into the center of mass and the relative coordinate. Okay, so now each one of them is a harmonic oscillator, you know, letter, um, and then, and then that sort of related to uh, what we could do in terms of controlling the motional state of the molecule. Okay, so a little bit about Feshbach, uh, Fano Feshbach resonance. Um, basically, you know, near the threshold, you can think of. Uh, I mean, in our case, of course, our molecules are already bound by the tweezer, but that's very shallow or very, very large, you know, length scale compared to the molecular potential. So in this picture, you can think of them as, you know, you can also think of them as not bound, you know, just colliding. They can be on resonance or they can be tuned on resonance via the change of a magnetic field uh, with atom combination in the different Zeeman levels such that that different Zeeman level could have a bound states that tune into resonance with, um, with these open channel, with these you know, free colliding uh, atoms. And when that happens, and, and there are couplings uh, between them. And I think, um, I don't know, Kaden, are these coupling, these non, non adiabatic? <laughs> This non-adiabatic coupling that you mentioned um, at, at the beginnings. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there are these. So normally these states are not uh, talking to one another. The triple state and the single state are not talking to one another. But there's these non-adiabatic coupling and and also some, you know, relativistic coupling. Such I, I that think it, there are probably both going on here. There yeah. may be an avoided crossing even without including the non-adiabatic couplings. Right, but, right. But when I mean, the, the world, yeah. Yeah, so it really depends, you know, when this gap opens up, how fast do you ramp through it here, right? Like how, how fast are the particles moving through it? Right, right, right. So, um, so, so anyway, so with these avoided crossing, one can ramp the magnetic field to turn the atoms into a molecule. Okay, so in terms of the emotional degrees of freedom, uh, I wanted to draw these, uh, draw onto these, uh, past, uh, you know, result from re the study from, uh, I guess, in, in the 2000s. And um, this, this was experiment done in bulk gas. And they found in this paper with many, you know, important people, um, <laughs> only one paper, they found that the creation efficiency uh, most importantly, depends on the phase space density of the gas prepare. Okay, so they did an experiment on rubidium you know, and separately from potassium. And the picture shown is that in the separated atom case, you know, we have in in the, what what we're showing here in in the energy uh, what we're showing you know these curves. They are for a particular, they're, they're in the relative coordinate, but for a particular emotional state, you know, V equal to zero. But there's different emotional state, you know, V equal to one, V equal to two, V equal to three. So only the ones that are already in the emotional ground state of the trap can be brought together to make a molecule. Everything else just go like this. Okay. So that that's so 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 therefore, uh, you can also imagine that the emotional state, like basically, preparing them in the emotional ground state is a is a prerequisite of making the molecule. Uh, so only these molecules are uh, sorry, only these atoms made it to the molecule. Okay. So so and and as a result, that these molecules are also in the emotional ground state. Okay, does that answer the question uh, of 
Garrett. Okay, so okay, so this um Okay, so this this is this is just a, a, a subtle deed that so these experiments were done with homonucleus species, you know, potassium, potassium, rubidium. Before you rubidium. go on, uh, can I, I? I'm just astonished. I'm trying to imagine what it would be like to be in a lab with that group of authors. Um, you know, I think <laughs> these are several labs, day. actually. Yeah, I wasn't. I was there, but I was, you know, I was. I was an early grad, you know, junior graduate student at the time. So it was, it was, that was, it was actually experiment from two labs, one from, um, you know, Wyman lab, one from um, Jing lab. And, and then, and then, but there was all these discussion and then, you know, there was always, there was at the time there was, you know, Eric, Carl and Debbie, um, these three groups there. Uh, and we will always have, group meetings together you know, every other week. So these tri-group meetings, and then these are sort of the products of uh, such discussion. So it was a very um, special time. Yeah, it was a it, very special time. I also find it interesting, a lot of these joint sort of group projects, uh, it seems very common in the molecule community. It's not so common for ultra-cold atoms, but ultra-cold molecules, there are a lot of joint groups. Yeah, right? and then I guess, you know, you know, Marcus was a postdoc here, so he was in the PI there. And then Cindy was the graduate student there, so you can see all these names. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so because of the comp okay, so in the heteronuclear case, you know, for when we want to make polar molecule, then they have to be, um, um, they have to be, the not only the overlap of the cloud has to be good. Um, there is also three body loss problems. So to optimize those actually ended up, these efficiency are relatively low, you know, not as good as say potassium, it could be as high as 90%. Rubidium alone, it could be, you know, 50%. And 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 these efficiency for hetero uh, nuclear species is usually like 10 to 20%, okay. So that was actually a motivation for myself to work with isolated atom to begin with. So hopefully sort of beat that number. Um, Okay, so now going back to starting with individual atoms, this is an experiment in 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 in, in my lab, and 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 I, and I was already alluded to that the absolute ground state atom give you an externally ground ground state, you know, motional ground state molecule, and then rotation ground state. Um, okay, so this is sort of the picture of the experiment. It's fairly simple in terms of the apparatus, but of course optics is very complicated. We have a glass cell here. We have our microscope objective, you know, sending an optical tweezer. We have these big sort of pancake style uh, uh, coils uh, exactly, you know, to have allowing beams to go through here and, and still providing a large uh, magnetic uh, field to allow us to ramp through the magnetic flash spot resonance of sodium cesium, which uh, was not um, studied prior to our work, uh, but nevertheless, we, you know, theory was very good uh, to that we, we've also found this or in the vicinity of what was predicted. So what you're showing us, what we're seeing here, you know, again, we have two body and one body. This is when we started with exactly two particles. And sometimes, like I say, we load with just one and that's still good for these, you know, control experiment. We see, um, as we ram through the resonance and stop at a particular uh, magnetic field, we you know we don't see much of anything until we cross the resonance. We see loss. Okay, so the reason we see loss is that we only image on the atom. So unless we reverse the process coherently, we don't recover then. Okay, so this this picture shows that we go from the atom and ram through the magnetic field and make molecule, and they look like loss. Okay, so a picture, you know, add in a weekly bound molecule um, and notation here. Okay, so now um, I think we're we're only six minutes to. Okay, so I'm going to not uh, go too much in detail because these points had already been elaborated. So by controlling the con atomic uh, you know, motional and internal degrees of freedom, we can map that, actually motional degrees of freedom uh, in, in this case, map that into uh, the, the resulting molecules. Okay, so I'm going to not uh, explain that. 
Uh, but I wanted to say one thing is that, um, which actually is a subtlety that uh, kind of answering Garrick's uh, question. So it turns out um, what I say was not exactly true so in terms of like, in terms of as long as they're in the relative coordinate, you know, ladder and equal to zero, they will, they have a chance of turning to molecules. But there could be small fraction as one can work out with this formula that my student worked out, uh, depends on how cold that you start out with. Some of them um, are actually emotional excited state, but it's a small fraction. Okay, so if we characterize that the molecule we made, 70, 70, 77% uh, 77 is in the ground state. Okay, so it's not exactly 100%, but it's pretty good. Okay, so now um, in the remaining time, I wanted to say that molecule we made is only up here. We still had to do the two photon process and I'm not going to go too much detail. Just think of it as a Raman transition. Think about this uh, two photon process like a Rabi also, you know, resulting in a Rabi oscillation like this clock ticking or, you know, two level system basically. You know, it's like everything is so ideal once you control them such that you can, you know, Robby flaw from weakly bound to row vibrational ground state and then go back and, 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 and then row vibrational ground state and, and so on. Okay. So by doing this, I'm skipping a lot of the details, of course, of, you know, the spectroscopy and what the choices of these levels need to be. Uh, to ultimately be able to make this molecule. Okay, so these molecules, okay, yeah, here, I'll remind you the picture of the clock ticking and they live um, in axis of few seconds. Okay. Now, uh, the last thing I wanted to show is that what I've explained is one molecule, you know, made from two atoms. Of course, if we want to entangle molecules, we need more than one uh, molecule. So, um, so what we've been working on um, in the lab um, in the last few months is to scale up the number of atoms to begin with. So we can have 10 cesium and 10 sodium side by side. We can cool them down to ground state. I'm go not going to explain this graph. So we can cool them down to the emotional ground state. We can merge them. We can make flash bulb molecules. And we have now you know, dark resonance of these molecules. Uh, five or 10 of them in a row. So we're very close to have a robust production of uh, molecule in an array. Um, and, and, then, and then that will allow us to begin to explore entanglement of, you know, or, you know, baby step, I guess, driving rotation transition and then, and then see if we can entangle if, them. If but we have, are, yeah. Sorry, if you have missing molecules, you can rearrange them just like you would for atoms to- Yeah, so that's them. actually a very good question. So. These molecules are we couldn't directly detect them, so so it's not as convenient as if we were to use a laser cool molecule. But um, so in the, that's the advantage of using laser cool molecules. Then you can you can see if it's you know there. If it's not, you eliminate that hole. But what we're thinking about is the predominant reason that we're not making a molecule is because they're not in emotional ground state. So if they're not in emotional ground state after our sequence, they're still atoms. So we can detect, okay, if we have atoms as opposed to you know, dark uh, that's there, then we know we didn't make a molecule and we can eliminate those. So hopefully that will allow us to have higher fidelity of, you know, uh, higher feeling of, a, of, of an array. Um, so that's what we're thinking. And we would you know, love to demonstrate that um, in the very near future. Um, so that's where I want to end. Um, um, here, um, and, uh, just to say that, you know, we have full control of individual molecule, we're extending them, and very soon we hope to be able to, you know, really, you know, we, we think we had the experimental ingredient to be able to, you know, start doing really interesting things with these molecules. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank awesome. you, Khan. So, oh, go ahead, Ian. Oh, I was just about to invite the students to ask questions. So there's already one question in the chat, so I'll just read that. Um, Garrett was asking if he saw the Feshbach resonance figure a couple slides back correctly. Mm -hmm. um, it says, 
did I see the energy of the Feshbach molecules lower than the energy of the atoms, or is it degenerate? Um, sorry, um, sorry. Sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. Yeah, so, so maybe, so Gary, you mean you this, big, this, this particular picture or? Yeah, that, that this picture. This just came out, it just came out, <laughs> yeah. Oh, so is this is this not real then? Yeah, this is this is just hand drawn. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, this is just to show that there is a void crossing and we can run from atom to molecule. Yeah. Okay. But so the energy of the atoms is degenerate with the Feshbach molecule then. Well, as we run through, yes. Okay. Yeah. It, it depends on the magnetic field, right? There's right. One it depends on so field value. Right? Yeah, this is a, another picture. Yeah, they don't have to be the same as a function of magnetic field. I see. Thank you. Sure. Um, there's a question from Vibhav. It asks, do these uh, sodium cesium molecules have strong dipole-dipole interactions? Yeah, yeah, I didn't mention that. Yeah, so these molecules have a very large dipole moment. It has a dipole moment of 4.6 dBi. And... Uh, on the scale of things, I would say absolute largest dipole moment you'll get from molecule probably is 10 dBi, and that's like sodium chloride, I guess, and we can't laser cool chloride. So um, so it's half that. So and, and, and then most of the molecule have about one dBi. So this is roughly five, um, 4.6. So it's quite large. And then and then the dipole dipole interaction scale is the dipole moment square. So um, that's a large wing. Um, and this is the reason we chose this molecule, despite the fact that not much, you know, at least in the bulk gas, the molecule committee didn't work on this. So we had to do a lot of the things um, um, ourselves in addition to developing the tweezer and stuff like that. Kwan, when you say dipole moment, do you mean that's the static dipole moment in the ground state or like the dipole moment in some stretch state? Yeah, that would be the dipole moment if we turn on the electric field and then we polarize in in that electric field. That would be the per, like in the molecular fixed friend dipole moment. But okay. so what would be relevant is if we have zero and one you know rotation states, then that dipole transition dipole moment would be this four point six divided four point six divided divided by some geometric factor. I think in this case square root three. So that's still sort of a figure of merit, um, but it's not the full four point six divided. It's some geometric re reduced by some geometric factor. It's interesting, you know, in optical lattices, you might actually get nervous about this large dipole moment being too big that it would interfere with other things. But I guess with the tweezers, you can just move things further apart if you run into issues, right? Yeah, I mean, the problem with tweezers, I would say, is that you can't get them close, right? <laughs> so it's actually, so then when we saw that we need to pull them apart for higher fidelity, we're like, okay, that's okay for us. <laughs> What is the spacing in the tweezers that you're working with now? So in this picture, um, in that picture, um, sorry, I just need to scroll. I, I, I'm blinking on it, but I think it's on the order of five microns. So they're not super close. Um, they're not like one micron, they're like five micron. But um, yeah, so we, I think our limits could be around three to five micron and not smaller um, and, um, but, but I think um, we do expect, you know, 100 hertz, probably 100 hertz of interaction, um, even at sort of three micron. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so it's a basic question and you probably has already mentioned it during the lecture. Can you um, elaborate on like how the entanglement is created through that polar exchange. Yeah, so, yeah, I wish there's a way where I can go back easy. Oh, there, yeah, so, yeah, so I kind of, I didn't go through the math. Uh, maybe I'll leave it as an exercise, it's a summer school, um, but I tell you exactly what you need to do, okay? So, so, Basically, we start with just these two states. So ignore this level, okay? So these are the two states that are going to, uh, that have the opposite parity and the same nucleus spin state. So that they, they're going to interact. You know, these states, they don't really interact because 
um, there are different nucleus spin states, but they have small coupling. Okay, so so these are the two states you can think of in Antoine Varway's talk, G and E. Okay, and then so we can first prepare a superposition, a 50 50 superposition of G, you know, zero and E. And then we wait for these time. And during this time, what's happening is that the dipole dipole interaction, which we can write down their coupling, you know, only couple basically. 0e and e0, as he had explained nicely in, in his you know, resonant dipole interaction. So the only couple of these two states. And if we do a unitary time evolution, which is the following, then you get this matrix. So you plug in pi over two omega into here, into the time, then you'll end up with, you know, as you'll see, you know, one, zero, 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 i, zero, zero i, um, sorry, zero i, zero, 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 one. Okay, and then you apply that unitary evolution to your initial superposition of, you know, of, of the two molecules. And then, and then the third step is to apply another global single particle pi over two pulse, just like how you prepare the 50-50. And then once you did all that math, then you'll see what you end up with is this, is a bell stay. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Sure. If you wait different amount of time, then their entanglement will be different. I would say, yeah. Um, could could I ask a question about this slide? Yes. Um, so so in this in this sequence, the the one state is not doing anything. I guess right. so. So could you? Uh, comment again on why, like what, what, what is the one state doing here? Yeah, um, so the one state here is not part, is very, is not participating in the dipolar exchange. So the idea here is that we have our qubits in zero and one, and somehow we need to bring whatever population is in one to the E states. You know, this is actually the next slide that I, I skip. So maybe I'll, I'll use this slide. So we start with say some kind of supervis that well we just think of then an, an excitation is well we just think of then as you know molecule one is in the zero state molecule two is in the one state and then through a pi pulse we're able to bring whatever is down here up here even though it's a different nucleus spin state but because of this internuclear because of this intermolecular coupling that I mentioned so that turns out to be allowed slightly, and so we can drive it. And then once, once so, so that means an excitation is now here. And then these two, these two molecules interact via dipole-dipole interaction uh, because these, this is the, this is their opposite parity states and the same nucleus spin state. And then once that happens, so the excitation now has swapped with a phase factor of I. Um, then we can bring back the population that's here down to zero, uh, down to one. So then effectively we entangle zero and one. So you can entangle zero and E, you, know, you can entangle molecule in zero and E, or you can entangle molecule in zero and one. But the way you entangle molecule in zero and one is through the to do this switchable interaction in some sense. So you so in some sense we we want them to not be interact so they're in the zero and one state, but we when we want to entangle them, we you know we we turn on the microwave to drive you know the population into E and then allow interaction and bring back down and stop the interaction basically. So this is a design to separate the task of um, you know storage and and and, and entanglement. Does that explain? Um, does that explain your question? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. What are you gonna do once you uh, get your gates working? Are you gonna spin off? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think even that there's many steps to it. So you know, I wanted to do that tomorrow, but you know, I realized there's you know still steps. You know, we want to make that very coherent. So we need to understand what is the a big a major um a major um a major um decoherent uh source is light shift, right? An optical tweezer is actually super intense. So the polarizability of the um 
of the molecule in the rotation ground state and rotation excited state is generally different. Um, and in this very intense electric field or intense you know, light field, oscillating field, um, that magic angle is different. You know, that the Christ, the consideration is different. So we have um, we have considered that and then you know came up with ideas that we can get into the magic condition and this and that. Uh, but one has to actually demonstrate all of that. So if we can show, we, you know, they're not, not, you know, we can show entanglement, you know, to begin with, that that will already be, you know, a very uh, a big step. And then, and then increasing that fidelity is, of course, um, turning it into a bit of a precision measurement experiment, <laughs> uh, understanding what are the limitations. And then, of course, we're interested in entanglement or in allowing them to interact, you know, it doesn't, you know, necessarily hit the entanglement uh, uh, criteria, but just allow them to interact in the in the array of um, molecules or a chain, and then, um, yeah. And I think I think you know we'll be asking you for uh, ideas. Uh, you know, working with synthetic dimension, you know, with the rotation state and things things like that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Garrett has a question. Yeah, so um, so I know this interaction takes place without, the dipole interaction takes place without fields, but to get the molecule from state one to state E, is that a local field or is this a field that applies to all uh, molecules? Yeah, so it's a microwave transition um, and, and it's microwave wavelength is very large compared to the extent of our cloud. So it's a global, uh, it's a global uh, pulse. And and what we're showing here, whoops, uh, yeah. What what I'm showing here is that we can light shift. We can individually address because these optical tweezers are already individually addressed, mm -hmm. and that we already have two different colors of tweezer because we built them from sodium cesium tweezer. You know, so we can imagine you know putting if we want to shift away ones that we don't want to um, drive into the, we want to individually address them. We, 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 we already have the tools in place. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Sure. So are there any further questions for Kong Quen for today? The good news is you have opportunity tomorrow. So this is not your last chance. Yes. <gasps> All right, so I know Zoom has some lag. So as I, usually as I start saying uh, uh, that's it, someone jumps into the question, but it looks like we're good for today. Uh, and remember to write down all your questions that you didn't remember so that you can bring them forth tomorrow. So thanks, thanks very much for your lecture and looking forward to some more wonderful molecules tomorrow. Great, thank you. Thanks, Kang-Gwen, see you. Yeah, see you. <laughs>